speaker, and I was also very pleased to join the all-party trip to Kiev uh, a week ago, and this will soon be uh, represented in my register of interests. If a deal involving peace for land was ever possible, now Ukrainians will not start to negotiate until all of their land is free from Russia, and that includes Donbass and Crimea. This was the firm view of every politician, soldier and citizen that I had the opportunity to meet in Ukraine. And one can see why, as the vile outcome of Russian occupation is revealed in territory retaken by the heroic actions of the Ukrainian military. Sadly, the horrors of Bucha are not an horrific isolated incident. Indeed, it's becoming clear that looting, torture, murder, rape and intimidation is the standard practice for the Russian occupiers. Horribly, Russia has deported tens of thousands of Ukrainian children, including 2,300 orphans to Russia. <coughs> These crimes must never be forgotten or overlooked. Yeah. And I was very pleased to hear of how UK prosecutors have been helping local agencies with evidence collection and advice. This war is more than just about helping a freedom-loving people fight against a bullying aggressor. As others have said, Russian aggression has been used time and time again under Putin, right from the invasion of Georgia in 2008. There is nothing to show that Russia would, unless stopped, stop at Ukraine. To that extent, Ukrainians are also fighting the war on behalf of all of us who refuse to accept a Europe where barbarity and violence are going to call the shots. And with that in mind, I think we should now consider Russia to constitute a, spot, a state sponsor of terrorism and that as such, it would be equitable for frozen Russian state and state-linked assets, including frozen sanctioned individual assets, to be seized for payment to Ukraine for its reconstruction. Hear, hear. This would require legislation, uh, but similar to that passed by Canada <laughs> only in June. I will. I, I, I thank you for giving way. Is he aware that we have just heard news that a young woman was killed in Moscow by the Russian police for participating in the anti-war demonstrations, and, and will, he, will he also condemn that? And the many other deaths that we're hearing about all the time coming out of Russia. The question recently came up as to whether individual oligarchs should be able to buy their way out of sanctions. I'm personally doubtful that this could work without the international sanction system being held under the waterline. However, if any deal should be co is considered, it has to be coordinated and approved by Ukraine. Not just the sanctioning country and the restitution money involved should go to Ukraine. In that way, any decisions on release of assets would be properly coordinated. Over recent months, there have been many pictures of Russian tourists wandering around Europe as though nothing is happening in Ukraine. This should stop, and we should now ban Russian visas to the UK other than for exceptional circumstances. Certainly, at the very least, we should not allow into the UK any member of Putin's United Party of Russia. Hear, hear. Sanctions are a slow burn approach, but increasingly effective. But there are the so-called holes, holes in the bucket. Turkey comes to mind. Yeah. And there are others. Could the minister please advise what efforts are being made to isolate such countries? But battlefield victories are accentuating the size of the challenges yet to be faced. Firstly, military speaking, Russia still maintains a powerful and vicious threat. Putin is an unpredictable enemy and wounded and concerned to protect his Crimea legacy to Russia. He may yet become even less principled over civilian rights. Indeed, only yesterday he upped the ante by calling out Russia's reserves. Secondly, retaking occupied territory is one thing, but holding it is another. Police, courts, schools and civil society all have to be re-established. War crimes and collaborators have to be prosecuted. Infrastructure has to be rebuilt. The cost and administrative challenges involved are enormous and urgent. Thirdly, <laughs> the military requirements are changing. In the early days of the war, basic equipment for soldiers and defensive weapons such as anti-tank missiles were priority. Then longer range artillery to break down Russian defences was and still is required to enable offensive operations. But then, following reoccupation, the priorities change again, and the need for anti-missile defence systems are now coming to the fore and were very much highlighted during our visit. If Ukraine is going to encourage its over 10 million internally displaced citizens and millions of foreign-based refugees to return to their homes in Ukraine, then security from air attack becomes key to restoring defence. Confidence. 
This point was very much reinforced by Russian retaliation against the lost ground, taking the cowardly form of missile attacks against civilian targets. Electricity and water infrastructure has already been bombed and a cold winter is approaching. So the challenges here are immense, but one thing is for sure, and came across very strongly during my time in Kyiv, namely U Ukrainian recognition of British support yeah. and the gratitude that was shown by everyone we met. Ukrainians feel that the UK is in this battle with them for the long term and that we were the first to speak up for them in the international community. Also, that we then back that up with money, arms and valuable advice. Yeah. The government and virtually all members of all parties of this House are to be commended for their support. History is on our side. Mm -hmm. I was left with a strong impression that out of this war, out of this horror and barbarity, will develop an immensely strong and lasting relationship between our two countries. In the meantime, we must redouble our efforts to ensure a speedy victory for Ukraine as soon as possible and enable its restoration towards the modern democratic country that I know it has the potential to be.